So I'd firstly like to acknowledge my co-authors, um, Gita Para, Cecilia Fasadori, and Luciana Moller, um, who this work would not be possible without. So we've heard about some of the threats to dolphins um, in the previous talk by Mike. Um, so we do know that dolphins in South Australia are impacted um, by anthropogenic impacts. So they do have, um, they are living um, adjacent to a highly urbanised city being Adelaide. And so there is a higher level of risk um, to threats for these dolphins. Um, so some of the threats that these dolphins are exposed to but are not limited to um, is from tourism and boating activities, coastal developments, um, pollution such as from stormwater or industrial waste, and then there's also marine debris. So looking at these into a little bit more detail, so we do know that along the Adelaide metropolitan coastline, um, these dolphins exhibit a significant change in their behaviour whilst in the presence of boats. So instead of carrying out feeding and travelling, when there's boats around, dolphins adapt more of a milling behaviour. There's also increased levels of heavy metals um, near our coastal waters. And there was also the outbreak of the cetacean morbilli virus, which occurred a couple of years ago now, but that impacted a minimum of 38 individuals along this coastline. Um, as Mike mentioned, there's also intentional killings um, of these dolphins. One thing that we don't really know much about is whether habitat modification um, and all the depletion of prey, whether that's having an impact on these dolphins, um, we don't really know. So the accumulation of all of these anthropogenic um, threats over time may lead to the displacement of dolphins and or their population decline. So it's really important for us to identify where these dolphins are most at risk. And this requires information on their distribution and preferred habitat. Now, unfortunately, we don't know too much about the ecology of dolphins in South Australia. So that's where I have come in. So the main aim of my PhD is to investigate the ecology and social structure of southern Australian bottlenose dolphins in Adelaide's coastal waters. However, I can't go through all of that in 15 minutes. So today, I'm just going to talk about their distribution and preferred habitat and how we can use this information to inform their conservation and management. So the aims of this talk here, um, are, well, this part of my study, are to use species distribution modelling um, techniques to identify preferred habitat. So what environmental variables are influencing the distribution of dolphins and is there a difference in their distribution across seasons? And then I also wanted to determine the importance and the ecological function of these areas. So I conducted two years of boat-based photo ID surveys covering approximately 40 k's of the metropolitan coastline. Uh, whoop, sorry. So these coloured lines here, they just represent my transects. So we travelled along those transects on the boat. Um, when we did see dolphins, we would stop, record information on their location, uh, the time, behaviour, um, group size and group composition. So to investigate habitat use of these dolphins, we need three things. So we need environmental variables, we need data on dolphin presence, and then we also need data on dolphin absence. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on all three of these, how I obtain them and how I will be using them, or how I have used them. So the environmental variables we obtained from the Nature Maps database provided by Duna online. So I obtained uh, information for benthic habitat, uh, water depth and slope. I did also try to use distance to shore, but that correlated quite well with water depth, so we just left that one out. And we selected these variables because they are known to influence the distribution of dolphins um, in other parts of Australia and the world. So dolphin presence was defined by any dolphin sighting that occurred whilst on transect, so whilst we were out on the boat on those zigzag lines. Um, so you can see here, um, these black dots represent the, our dolphin sightings across seasons. So we have summer, autumn and winter presences here. Now when we're out on the water and we just see ocean, we don't have any dolphins, we don't really know 
that the dolphins are not there. They could be under the water, it could be that we just didn't see them. So this means we may have some false absences in our data. Um, and this can lead to biased models. So to account for this, we base the location of our absent cells on survey effort. So what we did, we worked out where we had the highest survey effort across each season, and then we took our absent cells based on these areas. So these areas are most likely to be the areas where dolphins do not occur. We then created a binary presence-absence map using the presence-absence data, obviously. Um, so what this meant is that each grid within the study site was either given a 1 for dolphin presence or a 0 for dolphin absence. And we did this for each um, austral season um, that we surveyed through summer, autumn and winter. So we have all of the three things that we need. So what do we do now? So now we can use all this information um, for species distribution modelling. So this is a technique to let us describe the relationship between habitat and dolphin presence. So I use a combination of models. So I use what's called generalised linear models, generalised additive models and Maxent. And I use these three because then it provides us with a comparison of um, different modelling approaches. So GLMs and GAMs provide a presence-absence based modelling approach, while Maxent provides a presence-only based approach. Um, these three models were then implemented together in a software called Biomod, um, and impl Im implementing these um, model, model techniques together um, is a process called ensemble modelling. And of course, these models were applied separately to summer, autumn and winter, so we could see if there was any difference in dolphin distribution across seasons. So the software that we use uses a randomization procedure to determine the variables, um, to determine the importance of each environmental variable. So if we look at the table here, so the highest values are the ones of the most importance. So I've made it easy for you guys. I've made the ones of highest importance in red here. So if we look specifically at summer, we can see that um, both depth and benthic habitat is, seems to be having an influence on dolphin distribution. Whereas if we look to autumn and winter, it seems that it's just depth that has the most influence on these models. So these pretty pictures here, um, so obviously the Adelaide Metropolitan Coast are my study site, and these are the projections using the combination of the three modelling techniques that I used. So red means high probability and green means low probability of presence, that is. So if we look specifically at summer, you can see we get this quite a high probability of occurrence down around Hallett Cove. In autumn time, this kind of high probability of occurrence along these near shore waters. And then in winter time, we get a higher probability of occurrence um, deeper offshore. That's not to say the dolphins aren't within the area in winter, it's just they have a higher probability of presence in deeper waters. So we have this change across seasons and what I wanted to know is what could be influencing this change in dolphin distribution across seasons. So to do this, um, I was planning, we have to kind of work out why these areas are important for the dolphins. So we did this by looking at behavioural data. So we used a method called kernel density estimation to extract kernel ranges for behaviour. So we're going to find out where, where behaviours are more, most likely to occur. So the 50% kernel ranges are areas where 50, you have a 50% chance of seeing a dolphin engaged in a particular behaviour. So these are our core behavioural areas. And then the 95% kernel ranges are areas where there's a 95% chance of a dolphin being engaged in that behaviour. So these are, are our representative um, behavioural areas. Um, because there was a lack of data for some behaviours, we restricted this analysis to just feeding and travelling behaviours. And then we used these kernel, um, kernel ranges to calculate the percentage of overlap with the high probability of occurrence. So don't be too scared by this here. So the underlying map 
is just the ones that I showed you before. So we have the probability of dolphin occurrence across the seasons. The only difference now is that we've overlaid our, the, the kernel ranges. So the top here we have feeding, the bottom here we have traveling. The 50% kernel ranges, are, uh, you can see them by the black solid line, while the 95% kernel ranges are the dashed line. So if we look at summer here, we can see that 50% of the feeding behavior occurred, which seems to be over this Hallett Cove hotspot in summertime, um, where you can see that there isn't that much, in, there's some overlap here with the traveling, core traveling behavior, um, but not too much. And the same happens in autumn. So there's more, it seems that there's more of an overlap for feeding in autumn. And then in winter, there's not much overlap at all of core feeding areas with high probability of dolphin presence, but it seems that there is some more overlap of these area of traveling um, behaviors overlapping with high probability of occurrence. Um, I, told, I was told this isn't good enough, Nikki, you need to put numbers to this. So that's why I calculated the percentage of overlap. So the percentage of, let's go back, the percentage of, say, this circle here that overlaps with high probability of occurrence. So I think that was mostly, mostly just the red, the orange, and a little bit of the yellow being high. So over 50% chance. So that's what this table is here. This table just re represents the percentage of overlap. So during summer and autumn, we had a high percentage of core feeding areas overlapping with areas of high probability of occurrence. In contrast to winter, where we had a higher percentage of overlap of traveling behaviors overlapping with higher probability of occurrence. So what I took from this is it seems that in general, areas of higher probability of dolphin occurrence are seem to be influencing by this foraging feeding behavior. So it could be that prey movements are having an influence on dolphin distributions across seasons. Um, so I had a look at the movements of particular prey, we'll assume prey of dolphins within this area. So squid, um, they come into the metropolitan, into that southern metropolitan area in summertime and as the water cools, they kind of move north up the metropolitan coast and then around and do this anti-clockwise rotation whereas species of juvenile fish congregate in the southern metropolitan area in summer um, and they're a bit more dispersed throughout the area in autumn. In winter, I'm still not 100% sure what happens, whether it be colder water temperatures or increased turbidity that's driving fish away and possibly dolphins as well. I'm not too sure, but that's what I'm thinking at this stage. So just to sum all of that information up, so we have a seasonal distribution of dolphins along the metropolitan coast, um, and this distribution, um, the importance of water depth changes across seasons. So in summertime, summer and autumn, they prefer these near shore shallower areas, and in winter, it's the deeper offshore areas. And it's likely that prey availability is influencing these movements. So if we put this into a management perspective, so we do need to consider this, um, this change in their distribution across seasons for their management. So if we just look at summertime, um, we do know from some of my previous work that there are higher abundances of dolphins in summer. Um, we have that congregated area in Hallett Cove in summer, and we also have increased tourism. Tourism is known to affect their feeding behavior, so this could lead to an um, increased risk of dolphins in the summertime. So it could be that we would limit or restrict boats to that area over this time, just for the summer period, um, just so dolphins have a better chance to feed um, and thrive. And I just want to thank all of my funding bodies and a very big thank you to all of my volunteers. This work would not be possible without you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And we don't have any time for questions on that one.